We're in the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, and I am a partnerships manager here at All Voices, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Today, I am super excited to welcome our next guest to the show, Kara Golden. She is the CEO and founder of Hint. Kara, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I'm so excited for our discussion today. I know I reached out because when I was in college, Hint always donated water to our cause and it was always amazing. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, including your pronouns and what has recently brought you joy, we'll get into the discussion. Yeah. So I'm Kara Golden. I'm the founder and CEO of Hint. And uh, I started my company, um, gosh, it's over 16 years ago now, yeah. my company Hint, um, which is Actually, this product is an unsweetened flavored water. I'm drinking blackberry right now. And uh, I started it because I wanted to get off of diet soda and uh, diet Coke in particular, and um, had always thought that water was a better thing to drink. I aspired to be a water drinker, but found water really boring. And so that's why I decided to... Uh, to start my company, uh, I started it when I was um, I was actually pregnant with my fourth child, and uh, and so uh, you know not maybe the the uh, the picture of an entrepreneur that anyone thought was going to be able to go do it right. I was delivering my first case and getting it on the shelf while on the day that my son was actually born, and um, you know it's a crazy wild ride to think back on on kind of how it all started. Absolutely. I was just reading that in your in your book as well. You're like one delivery down, another one to go, um, yeah. which is absolutely incredible. And you've called yourself an accidental entrepreneur um, before. Can you tell us a little bit about what you meant by that and how you think that really impacted your journey um, to taking hint where it is today? Sure. I mean, it's, it's interesting because over the years, and particularly when I was starting Hint, people asked me, did you always know you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Were you born this way? And I used to think a lot about that. I mean, what, what was it that, you know, was I always an entrepreneur? And, you know, I think looking back is really, uh, you know, great because you can look back and say, well, I did start a camp when I was, you know, a kid when I, I think I was 12 years old, started my own kids camp. And, um, but I definitely had other roles along the way where I was, um, you know, not only working at a toy store and was waitressing, but then when I finally uh, moved to New York after my first job, I actually got a call from a recruiter who was recruiting for CNN. And it's funny to think back, you know, today, like CNN seems like such a big company. It was a late stage yeah. startup, right? In the nineties. And it was, you know, Ted Turner was still running around the office, you know, just with his dream and his vision. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about, uh, you know, how prepared I was for being an entrepreneur, I think it was uh, I was really fortunate to be able to have worked in situations, um, whether that was starting my own camp or, uh, or, you know, working for somebody like, you know, CNN and Ted Turner, and then ultimately a little startup and then Steve Case at AOL, where, you know, these were entrepreneurs who were considered a little crazy, right? When they first started. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, over time, what you saw was how hard they worked, how they really led kind of the conversation around the vision of being able to get something started. And, you know, something I think a lot about in, you know, an entrepreneur's journey is that you, you can't waver, right? You can't, you can, you can pivot, but you can't waver. And there's a difference between the two, right? That you have to be the one that's putting stakes in the ground around the overall mission and the overall purpose of your brand. And I think people are relying on you to really keep those stakes in the ground. And when you, um, you know, when I think back on these companies that I had been a part of, I saw that, but I didn't know I was watching it. I just watched it and watched what I was what I was supporting, what I was following. Mm -hmm. And so I think having done that a few times, maybe that made me, you know, fearless, relentless, because I realized that these were just normal people, 
they were a little crazy, right? They did have an idea that was like ahead of where everybody else was. But to be able to kind of work underneath um, directly or indirectly somebody that kind of has that vision for something, it sort of gives you this confidence that if they can do it, I can do it too. And frankly, it's one of the reasons why I wrote my book too, because I felt like, you know, being an entrepreneur and, you know, being a successful entrepreneur is not, it's not magic, right? It's a lot of hard work. It's a choice uh, that I share with people that it's, uh, you know, you can make a lot more money doing other things, but it's, it's a lot of fun. It satisfies a lot of curiosities. And, um, but again, I think it's, it, 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 you know, I, I didn't go and work for these people thinking, okay, one day I'm going to go start my own company and maybe, right. maybe others do, and that's fine. Um, but I did not. And so I think more than anything, it really speaks to entrepreneurs can come from anywhere. They don't have to be born with it. Um, they can decide later on, um, they can make those decisions even after they've been on a journey and, and they just decide they have this idea that they can't kind of get rid of in their mind that they want to go solve. Absolutely. It sounds like you've always had a really entrepreneurial spirit and super hard working throughout your career. And I do want to talk about the book you wrote too, in terms of you named it Undaunted, Overcoming Doubts and Doubters. And I wanted to know what your overarching message was to the reader for really choosing the word Undaunted. I have a copy right here as well. Um, and really what it means to you. Well, I, I was, uh, it's, it's funny because I turned in the manuscript and I didn't even have a title for the book yet. <laughs> I mean, I was, you know, kind of just, I, I had been writing for five years and this yeah. was my journal. And then, uh, probably the hardest part about writing a book was, um, editing it down because I kept, you know, I worked closely with, uh, with a couple of editor, editors and part of, you know, I'd be like, fighting for like, don't take that story out. That story is so good, but it had yeah. to get down to like 200 pages in order to be, you know, not too daunting for people to, to read. And, uh, but, you know, when I think back on, on just how, how people have labeled me over the years, like this mm -hmm. fearless risk taker and, and, uh, you know, very resilient. And they've asked how do how do how does one become that way? How do they become that way? I thought, you know, it really is kind of like starting a company and being an entrepreneur. It's really making a decision that I'm going to live undaunted, that I will have fears along the way. I mm -hmm. will have doubts along the way, but I have to make a choice to, to really go and face those fears and tell, and, and tell myself that it's okay to feel a little uneasy, right? Especially mm -hmm. when something's new. I think that the biggest challenge for people that are thinking about, you know, doing something new, whether that's starting a new company or going to a new job or traveling to a new place or taking on their fears is that they worry that they'll fail yeah. and they'll look stupid or they'll waste their time in some way, right? And so I think I, what I want people to know is that living undaunted really kind of places you in the journey that you're meant to go. Right. Mm -hmm. And I've always said to people when they, when they've been trying to make a decision on something that they're feeling a little, you know, uneasy about, I'm like, well, can you go back? Like, mm -hmm. let's just say that it's about a job that you're thinking about moving on to, you know, a totally different, you know, job, could you actually go back to your previous job? I mean, probably. I mean, if you're sitting here having this discussion, maybe if you do it right, you could, you know, you could tell somebody that you're choosing to go on and here's why maybe you're going to le learn new things. Maybe it's in a different industry, whatever it is, but you can go back. And it's funny how many times people don't really think about that. Right. Mm -hmm. They're sitting here instead worried about like, Oh, if I make this decision, that's it. Right. I mean, I've, I've like made my bed. Well, not really. I mean, I, I, I think more than anything, it really is. If you can articulate why you're doing that, why are you so curious about it? Why are you so interested in it? And that is what I want to encourage people to do. And, and also I think really know too that, and, and let people know that 
it's uh everybody has fears everybody has mm -hmm. doubts and it's uh it's really what you do with those things and it's a lot of fun when you can go tackle your own doubts and fears again everyone has them if you think about those times when you were really afraid and then you went out and really faced those fears oftentimes it's really not as bad as you ever thought. And you kind of surprised yourself, right? What you could ultimately do and what you could figure out. Maybe that's like running a marathon. You never thought you could do it. And then you started figuring it out and you did it by actually putting the steps in place. And, and again, when you accomplish something that you didn't set out to think you could, that's a really powerful thing. And you do become more resilient you do become fearless just by, by acting that way. So that is what I want to encourage people to do is to really go and, and live undaunted. Yeah, I absolutely love that philosophy. And I think you're right that we all have doubts, whether we say them out loud or they're in our heads, but we also come across doubters too, who really talk that into, into motion as well. Um, and I know you provide a couple of different examples uh, when you were launching the business and when you're pitching it to folks of what you came across in terms of your internal doubts or doubters. Can you give us an example that's either in the book or you know outside of the book as well? Yeah, I mean, certainly when I was getting trying thinking about getting the product on the shelf, let me lay it out for you. So if uh, you know, it's one thing to come up with the idea, I'm gonna go launch a, a product on the shelves at Whole Foods, right? A beverage right. company, and then suddenly maybe somebody says to you, How are you gonna do that? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm gonna go to the store, I'm gonna, you know, find the buyer then you've got the doubters, right? You've now, right. you've now asked for their participation and, and, you know, to, to weigh in, right. And, and you've already got your doubts as to how this is all going to work. You know, you've got to get in your car, you drive there. What if the buyer isn't there? All these like things are going through your head, but then the doubters come in mm -hmm. and they'll say, oh, well, how do you know it's the right person? How do you know it's like a product that they'll want? Whatever it is. And, and then you start to, you feed off of those comments too. And then you start to wonder yeah. whether or not, well, maybe I, I'm not really meant to do this, all of these things. And I think, again, you have to, you have to kind of reset yourself and just say, I'm going to go do it anyway. And I'm going to go try and, and keep moving forward. And, and that was the situation for, you know, me or in the early days of, of Hint, where I was just sharing the story with somebody earlier that I, I remember when I was trying to get the product on the shelf at Whole Foods. I mean, I thought like, okay, I get it on the shelf. But then what I figured out pretty quickly was that there were so many other things that I didn't know. And there were so many things that I, you know, would be really anxious about, like, how do I produce a product that has a longer shelf life? I kept, fe mm -hmm. I kept feeling like the line, they would draw the line and say, okay, as long as you get it to here, you get it on the shelf, everything's going to be great. And then I got it on the shelf and then I was like, woo. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, well, you need three more months on the shelf life. And I'm like, what? You know, it's like, it's like in school, somebody's extended your test, right? And you're like, what? Yeah, you know, that's not fair. And they're like, well, do you want to be on the shelf or not? And you're just like, mm -hmm. yeah, but I thought I knew the rules. Exactly. And they're like, well, th these are the new rules. So this was constantly happening, mm -hmm. you know, to me. And, and I think that, again, you, you make this decision as to whether or not you want to be an entrepreneur. It is not for the faint of heart. It is for, <laughs> you know, it is whether you think about it in, in the, in a way like, you know, somebody keeps moving the line further and further, or somebody keeps adding onto your test, or they keep adding to your puzzle and taking puzzle pieces away. I mean, it's just like, it can be incredibly frustrating for mm -hmm. people. Um, but I think on the other hand, when you, when you feel like you're, you're getting wins under your belt and you're really making progress. And in our case, I mean, I knew, I, I knew we were launching a new product in a new company, but what I figured out pretty quickly and primarily because many of the buyers that I was talking to were kind of sharing sort of what we had to fit into was that I was launching a new category mm -hmm. in the beverage industry. Yeah. So in the be beverage industry, there's water and there's like, enhanced water. And then there's, you know, diet drinks and juice and regular soda. 
So I was creating a product that was called unsweetened flavored water. So the buyers would taste the product and then they would say, well, what's it sweetened with? And I'm like, are you listening? It's unsweetened <laughs> flavored water, right? I mean, right. and they'd say, oh, well, we don't really have, like, who's your competition? No one, because we're the only one that's doing right. it. And then they'd say, well, so the category is not big enough because you're the only one. I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, like, what am I supposed to do? Go create my own competition? Right. I mean, right. it just, it, it just seemed crazy. Mm -hmm. And so again, I, I think that, you can have, you know, your own bumps in the road. You can have, um, you can think that you're, you know, finally climbing to the top of the mountain and you're there, but being an entrepreneur, the, the best entrepreneurs will tell you the story that they just keep adding on to it and you keep yeah. running into these hurdles. And, and again, I think that if you, if you're never making progress, that's where it becomes, you know, a, 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 an incredibly tough road for people and a lonely road as well, mm -hmm. where you feel like, you know, you thought you, you thought you were making progress. And then suddenly like, you know, you went five steps back. You didn't just go one step back. And yeah. that's the story for so many different entrepreneurs. Absolutely. And Hint as a company has really progressed in terms of all the folks that really want to be part of the mission with you as well. And who are really passionate about the product. Um, and I would love to ask too, as a leader, I know like Hint is committed to building an inclusive environment for all employees too, as you continue to grow um, and scale. How do you really think about building that sense of community and practice um, at, at Hint as a company? Yeah, well, I think it, it really starts, you know, it's, I think in many ways, if you're building your company from like, from one, right. And you start to, <laughs> yeah. and you start to build it. I, I mean, it's interesting. I've met, you know, many people in, in large organizations over the years, many of my friends where, uh, you know, it really, it kind of starts with the founder, right. And their own belief system. And I think that it's, um, it, and it's, it's, easier to build from, you know, square one versus having to undo and fix things, right? That, that is something that I, you know, don't, uh, I, I don't want to ever be in that position because it's, <laughs> it's hard, right? It's really, really tough. And I think it's what, what you're really talking about too is, is culture. And, and yeah. I think for, for us, as I started building hint, I mean, first of all, like picture this, I'm, you know, this, pregnant woman who's going into stores, mm -hmm. delivering my child, my fourth child shortly after um, the, or, or I should say shortly after the first bottle was on the shelf at, at mm -hmm. Whole Foods. And I'm asking people, I want to hire a couple of people into the company and I'm asking them to, you know, sign on to this crazy woman with four kids under the age of six with no beverage experience, right? I mean, it was just not the picture of, of faith, right? That this yeah. thing was all gonna pan out. But I think what our initial kind of culture and pull was health, right? Mm -hmm. and, and health and wellness. And I mean, we're also in Silicon Valley, we're in San Francisco Bay Area, but we compete against, you know, a lot of tech firms, right? Where, you know, we have, incredibly, you know, capable people who could work in a lot of different industries, but they mm -hmm. chose to work in health and wellness because they really believed that that was a priority. And so health and wellness kind of stems out. I mean, we definitely have had some people who have had, you know, diabetes and, and, yeah. you know, sort of that obvious world, but then there's other people who, have just really enjoyed hint because like me, they, they wanted to drink more water and hint really helped them to do that. But then there's other people who have been, you know, really helped by hint yeah. for, through cancer, um, through, you know, they've seen their loved ones helped by, you know, a product like hint. And so I think when you, when you have a company and in our case, a, a product that really helps people, I think that that 
really helps people to want to kind of form a bond. It's not just like you're working for um, a company. It's really, and, and I won't say family because I, I think that, I don't know, I sort of struggle with that because I do believe that people are being paid, but, but they have to enjoy and they have to believe in the mission and why they're coming here. And I think, you know, people have said to me, do people come to work at Hint because it's a female founded company? And I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I, I, like we've had people say that like, oh, I, you know, love that it's a female founded company. Mm -hmm. I think you have to have a great product. You have to have, you know, you come in knowing that there is definitely, this is a company that has a mission and has a purpose Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's really what they're joining. But I think more than anything, the people that come in, they're very thoughtful about it. Like, I think there's, there's, it, if anything, it's been the reverse where maybe we haven't hired or maybe we haven't been able to recruit, you know, certain guys because they don't want to come work for a female founded company. I don't know. Right. It's one of those things that I'm, I've, you know, often thought when people have asked me that, but again, I would rather they not show up. Mm -hmm. Right. Because maybe that those same people will be the people that will create that environment that I, that makes me nervous, right. That makes me that the one that I talked about in the beginning that I'm so happy that I don't have to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like a lot of the folks who come and are naturally attracted to Hint are really passionate about the product, a mission-driven company, and it really has impacted their lives in a large way. So it naturally fosters that environment where people feel like they can totally. kind of bring themselves to work and also foster kindness in the workplace, which I know you talk a lot about in, in your book as well. And part of that kindness is, is in feedback and leveling up the product and leveling up the people who work at Hint too. How do you really lead with kindness when you're giving or receiving feedback on your, your team? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I I think that first of all, it's, I would say that our, the culture that we've created, I mean, first of all, when people are showing up, they're very curious, right. And they're very, I I think being able to ask questions, um, and participate. Um, I've never been a huge, um, you know, kind of believer in titles and, Mm -hmm. um, and because I think titles start to create, um, like a, you know, I can tell you what to do, but you can't tell me what to do. I don't know if that, if like it, and it, right. And, and I feel like instead it really starts with, um, being kind to one another, um, being, uh, ideas, I think in our company, it's very, very clear to everybody that ideas can come from anywhere. If you really wanted to sit in on a meeting, for example, just because you wanted to learn because you were really curious, I I can't imagine that people, even if it wasn't your division, wouldn't let you come in and sit in on it. Um, And so again, I think that that look, I, I remember when I had my first startup uh, job at a little company called Two Market. It was my first when yeah. I first moved to um, Silicon Valley. I, I'll never forget. There were five guys that actually worked at Apple for Steve for Steve Jobs, yeah. and it was an idea that Steve had. And um, you know, I had I was uh, I cold called um, this guy and got him to you know, agree to meet with me. I took them to coffee. And, and it was funny because I was so enamored with the fact that they had worked for Steve at Apple. And he was so enamored with the fact that I had worked for, you know, Ted Turner indirectly at CNN because CNN was such a great brand. I thought Apple was such a great brand. And it's funny because when, after a few more conversations, he offered me a a job and Mm -hmm. I'll, I I looked around at sort of their backgrounds and I was so used to doing that when I was in New York and kind of in the environments at time and then CNN. And, you know, these couple of guys had PhDs, they were engineers, they were, I mean, you know, they went to Stanford, they went to, they went to all the right places. Right. And I remember they were really trying to probe me to see whether or not I could participate. 
And I remember prior to me, you know, I got this job offer and one of them said to me, do you think you can contribute? And I thought it was like such an interesting question because again, you know, first of all, I was the only woman. Yeah. And then second, I was clearly younger and more junior, but I was also, you know, and and in a totally different industry, I'd been in media, I hadn't been in kind of tech and, and I just, I said, yes. And then I, I remember walking out into the parking lot and thinking, what a strange like question. But I think back on that question a lot now, because it's one that, you know, is really important. And frankly, I've asked it a lot when I'm hiring people, like, do you think you can contribute? Because it's kind of like, why are you here? Mm-hmm. Right. If you, if you can't contribute, I mean, if you don't feel, I feel like there's so many opportunities out there for everyone. Mm -hmm. If you, if you feel like you can contribute, if you don't feel like you can contribute, then you're just taking a job to, you know, pay the bills. Do you know what I mean? And there's, that's fine, I guess, but there's so many other opportunities for you. And so that was like the moment when I really felt like that was I, I, I said, yes. And then I, I don't know if I really believed it until a couple of weeks. Cause I didn't really know, right. I did this. It, we were in an interviewing phase. We didn't really know, but I think that that's something that I think about a lot is, um, is really, you know, when somebody's asking you that question, I think it's, first of all, it's kind because mm-hmm. they're not talking down to you. They want to have a dialogue with you, but they yeah. also want to hear, can you contribute? And I think that that is like, that's the beginning of kindness, right? That is, that is when people want to hear your voice. That's when people want to know, you know, what else can you think about? And again, selfishly, they want that because they want to work with somebody like that, but they also want to, you know, they're, they're hoping that your contributions are going to help them to scale. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's kind of a, like, why wouldn't you want contributors in your company? Why would you, why would you just hire somebody just to do a task, I guess, is, is the, is kind of the bigger thought on it. But anyway. No, I really like that question as well. And in terms of having people want to actively participate and want to contribute to a company, a mission overarching is really important as well. Have you started asking kind of different questions over this past year to folks, do you think the role of leaders has changed um, throughout the pandemic and just the changing world of work that we're seeing? You know, again, having a founder still in a company, I still, I try to do (laughs) as much interviewing, you know, as possible. It's been a crazy um, year with my book launch and everything else going on. But I think that the most important thing is um, that what I've seen during this time. And again, I think it, you know, it was always sort of like this when I hired the first employee, when I hired the fifth employee, right? The the first direct to consumer head, like all of these different roles, you want to hire people in who, you know, not necessarily think the same way that you do, because you want to hire people who think differently so that they can contribute and, you know, help you grow and help you think about things. But you want people who, I guess, just really want to, you know, be there too. And I think that, that for, for the, for the last year in particular, I mean, look, we have, we have people who have been long-term employees and short-term employees who have had to deal with, you know, a lot over the last 17 months. I mean, everything from, you know, dealing with faraway parents, um, Mm -hmm. to, you know, people passing away to, to managing kids that are at home and, you know, while they're doing a zoom call and they're trying to, you know, keep it all together and loneliness and all of these things. And I think for me, it's, it's just being human. Right. And Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever lost that side of me. Um, I mean, I'm a parent of, you know, kids that have dealt with all kinds of stuff too. And again, being very close, never going too far away from, you know, the hiring process and the people that we're bringing into, you know, our office and, and our company. But, um, but I do believe that, you know, leadership has kind of 
has changed over time for so many because it used to be, you know, separating what you're doing in business with separating mm -hmm. what you were doing at home. And obviously none of us had a choice, right? We were trying to operate from home and continue, continue to, you know, operate the business, not stay complacent and move forward. But, you know, the reality is, is that I think you have to, um, you have to take it easy on people. You have to take it easy on yourself too. And, um, and know that, you know, I had never managed through a pandemic yeah. before. And so I think knowing that, you know, I was trying to do what I was, um, signing up to do, even though I never knew that there, that this would happen was, um, you know, I, I shared with the team that I, I hope that we're going to, um, be able to, you know, do all the right things, but also I'm going to need your help to do the right things. And I mean, whole longer story, but we're an essential product too. So for us during the pandemic, it was, um, you know, rather than telling people and, and, and confirming with people that they'd be sheltering in place, um, we were asking all of our employees to work. And so um, that we have over, you know, 200 employees in the company, a hundred of them were still going out to stores, still, you know, going out mm -hmm. to merchandise. And, you know, I didn't feel right sending my team out. So I went out with them and mm -hmm. I took on a route in Marin County where I live. I went back to my roots of yeah. what I was doing in the beginning. And I think that I didn't intend to do it to show employees, but I wanted my employees to be safe. I wanted to make sure I didn't want it on my watch that, you know, people got sick mm -hmm. and that they were, you know, in danger in some way. And so I think for me, I, I really, I did it for my own reasons, but did that show up to employees as, mm -hmm. you know, somebody that cares and somebody who's thoughtful, hopefully. Um, but you know, it was just what I was doing because I couldn't think I have empathy. I, I couldn't think of, you know, any other way to do it. Absolutely. It comes back to that human centric approach and just thinking, talk about leading by example too, even though that wasn't the intention, it was coming from, from a different place. But I think that really speaks, speaks volumes. And for folks who are listening to your story and thinking, I want to be like Kara, I want to be an accidental entrepreneur. What advice would you give to them uh, for folks who are listening? I think, first of all, you have to have an idea, like being an entrepreneur, it's, um, it's kind of, you know, the, the, the role of the year or the last <laughs> few years. And, you know, I think, look, when I was in college, there were no classes in entrepreneurship. And, and I think it's great that there are now, but I, I feel like um, it's, there's this idea that entrepreneurship is um, you're going to be a unicorn or you're going to be a failure. And I think there's a lot of stuff that happens in between that is really um, that's really critical. And I think that there's no, you know, one path either that people have said, should I do it right when I get out of college or should I go and work for some big company for a while and then go start one. And I, I think it really starts with having a good idea and also like solving a problem. I think that that is, those are the entrepreneurships that we really, you know, need to see happen. And it doesn't, I think you can't allow yourself to be um, scared and doubt yourself that just because you're a woman, you can't go start a company. Um, just because you don't have experience, you can't go start a company. It really, I think that you have to figure out how you can do it. And mm -hmm. is it, are you going to have to knock on more doors or, um, you know, is it going to take you longer? Maybe, but I think that the key thing is, is having that idea and then figuring out how to build around it. And, you know, it's, it's um, just because you have a great idea too. I think that you have to have a great support system around you, not just in your business life, but also in your personal life and, you know, be able to support everything that you've got going on around you too, is just really, really critical in, in your path too. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really critical advice. And also everybody needs that good support system professionally and personally to make sure that you're taking care of yourself and that you have a vision um, that you're working towards as well. I always like to ask too, if there's anything that I didn't ask you that you want to share with the folks who are listening or just a key takeaway uh, that you hope people, you know, listen to uh, the podcast for. 
I think believe in, believe in yourself. Right. And I think that believe that you can do it. And again, when you really think about what's the worst that can happen, if, if the answer is failure there, failure is, uh, is, is not that bad. And I say that, you know, if you fail, what are the lessons that you're learning along the way? And are you meant to actually be learning those lessons so that you can, that so that you can learn from those lessons for whatever you're destined to do. And I'm, I'm such a big believer. If you believe in the journey and believe in yourself, I think that, uh, that ideas will start to come to you and, uh, and it's your opportunity to say yes or say no to them. Absolutely. There's going to be doubts. There's going to be doubters. There's, it's not a linear path, but if you have that trust and belief in yourself and conviction, absolutely. We'll move forward, which I I definitely love. Kara, thank you so much for one, writing your book to share your story with us and being on the podcast today and all the work that you do um, at Hint and in the community. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Of course. And as a reminder for folks who are listening, All Voices believes in the empowerment of everyone to speak up at an organization for folks to succeed. And we'll speak soon.